Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, isn't it? We had that little bit of snow the other day. It was funny. I talked to Olivia, who's in New York, and I said, how much snow did you get? Because they got the same storm, and she said, not much, just a little over a foot, you know. <laughs> and again, everything's relative because uh, that's not a lot up there. You can get a foot per hour. Um, so it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And Christmas time, which should be a season of joy, for many Christians can be a time of conflicted conscience. It can be a time of out-and-out -out conflict within the church. I, I know of an assembly of the Lord's people where the leadership sent letters of condemnation and a demand to repent because a couple of their members marched in a Christmas parade in the local community. This time, again, that should be of joy, can be of joy, for many Christians is a time of confusion and even kind of a, a glum not sure what to do, but it need not be like that. One of my favorite Christmas sermon titles is from Edwin Jones, and the title was, Jesus was born, and that's okay. <laughs> so this morning, with understanding, comes joy. With misunderstanding and confusion comes fear. Let's talk about Christmas. Let's talk first about what Christmas is and what it isn't. Let's talk about what Christianity is and what it isn't. And then finally, let's talk about what clever is and what clever is not. To begin, what is Christmas? Brethren, it is not the day that our Lord was born. It's not. We do not know what day he was born on. Truth be told, we don't even know the year that he was born. That should tell us something about the relative significance of that day. What we do know with regards to the when of our Lord's birth is in Matthew 4 and verse, or excuse me, Matthew 2 and verse 1, we read that Herod the Great was the king when Jesus was born. Secular history tells us that Herod the Great, that king, died in 4 BC, okay? We also know later in chapter two of Matthew that Herod later tried to kill Jesus once he had heard that a supposed uh, king of the Jews had been born. That horrible slaughter of the innocents that we read about at the end of Matthew chapter two. Jesus could have been as much as two years old when that happened. And so the best guess that you'll see out there, the best number I've seen that people arrive at, is that Jesus was probably born in the year 6 B.C., which, for an Irishman, is hilarious. The idea that the Christ was born six years before the Christ <laughs> is kind of funny. Main issue is we don't know the year. We don't know the day. What about the month? Why is Christmas December 25th? That's pretty specific. Well, we don't know what month exactly Jesus was born, but we pretty much know that it was not December. The reason we know that is in Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, we read that at the time of Jesus' birth, the shepherds were staying out in the fields with their flocks, something you do not do in December in Israel. It is too cold and it is too wet. So what month was he born? Best answers I've seen is a late August, early September. And they calculate that by looking at uh, John the Baptist's father in his cycle and, and his time of serving in the priesthood and then his wife being with child at that time and then trying to calculate. So late August, early September. Christmas is not the day our Lord was born. Christian, excuse me, Christmas began as a way for the Roman Catholic Church to co-opt pagan festivals. 
Pagans were, were coming into the Catholic Church in large numbers, and these pagans were used to having large festivals and celebrations around the winter solstice. The, the worship of Saturn was a big one. So what was done is they took that time frame and they put a Christian spin on it. We'll allow you to have a party around the time of the winter solstice, but it will be a party to celebrate the birth of Jesus. That's where Christmas, as we know it, date-wise, came from. Well, Christmas in the United States, what is it? Brethren, it is a secular, and that means non-religious, holiday. The government of the United States of America decided that they were going to remember and honor the day, the birth of our Lord. And brethren, that should make us happy. Yes, there's a lot of things that have been added to it. There's a fat guy that comes around now and he does things. And there's other aspects where I, I don't see how that relates at all to Christianity, but they have uh, grown up around the tradition. There are a lot of out-and-out -out mistakes with the regards of observance of Christmas. You, you, we always see the, the nativity scene, right? And you've got the shepherd there, and then you've got the wise men there. And there are three wise men. We have no idea how many wise men there were. We know there were three gifts. And the wise men and the shepherd were not there at the same time. More than likely, the wise men were there up to two years later. But again, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of misinformation out there. But we should see that as an opportunity. More on that later. What is Christmas? It's a secular harbor. Har har I'm confusing my thoughts. It's a secular holiday. Does anybody here celebrate Arbor Day? Me neither. Me neither. But you could. And nobody would have a problem with going out and planting a tree, right? Christmas is really no different. It is a secular holiday. But it is a holiday where at least our country and most of the world at least gives lip service to our Lord and Savior. And for that, we should be happy. That's what Christmas is. That's what Christmas is not. Let's talk about Christianity, what it is and what it is not. Well, in short, Christianity is a result of that amazing day. Have you ever thought? about the idea of God coming into the world, and you're saying, of course I have, Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, John 1 and verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt, tabernacled among us. But think about that. Think about God, Jesus Christ, in whom dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2 and verse 9. He came into the world a crying newborn, helpless, a baby, God. Can you even imagine? I can't. And yet, that amazing event happened. On what day? I have no idea. But so much of Christianity, it's dependent on that day having happened. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Well, that giving began when he was born. Born of a woman, fulfilling the promise in the garden of Genesis 3.15, born under the law, fulfilling that promise of Genesis 12 and 3 and Genesis 22 and 18. That birth was the beginning of that giving. Jesus in John chapter 10 and verse 10 said, I have come that they may have life and life abundantly. His coming is that birth. And without that, we don't have that abundant life. Romans 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That beginning, before Christ could die for us, he had to be born for us. 1 John 2 and verse 2, Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, the satisfaction of wrath, and not just for us alone, but for the entire world. Brethren, he couldn't have been that sacrifice and give his life except he was born. So Christianity, what is it? It's a direct result of that incredible day, whenever it was. But here's what Christianity is not. Christianity is not about us being able to arbitrarily make up days of religious observance. 
We do not have that authority. God alone has that authority. One of my favorite verses, Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 5. The Jews have returned from Babylonian captivity. They have reestablished the temple, has been built. And the people come to the priests and they say, should we continue to fast and observe our memorial of when the temple was destroyed in 586 BC? And God, speaking through the priest, says to them, you kept this fast for me, comma, for me? God never asked them to remember that day with a special fast. God never asked them to remember that day at all. They had done it for themselves and then said they were doing it for God. And God was very plain saying, you're asking me if you should continue in this fast. I don't know what you're talking about. I never told you to fast. You're saying that was for me? I didn't tell you. We don't have that right. Only God has the authority to establish a day of observance. I'm pretty sure it's written on the front of this table here. Do this in remembrance of me. That's the observance that we have, that we've been commanded by our Lord. We don't have the right to make up any other one we want. As a matter of fact, if you open your Bibles, let's look at a couple places where it's directly condemned. Beginning in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 8. Right after 2 Corinthians, right before Ephesians. Galatians 4, 8 through 11. The Apostle Paul wrote, But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be a bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. We understand from Romans and many other places that the coming of the Christ was the end of the law of Moses. Yet it appears that Judaizing teachers were going in among the early church and understand they were Christians too. But they were saying you still had to keep aspects of the law of Moses. Sabbaths and festivals and days and months and observances. And Paul's saying, wait a minute. I taught you that when Christ came as the fulfillment of the law of Moses, taking it out of the way and beginning the new covenant, that why are you going back? Why are you wanting to be a slave again to the old Jewish law and calendar? You can't do that, as he said, because I'm afraid that maybe me bringing Christ to you was a waste of time if you're just going to fall back into worshiping things of the law of Moses. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Right after 2 Thessalonians, conveniently before 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. We don't have the right to institute religious rules. We are not God. We are not the Lord. And in this case, he's saying there are some that are forbidding marriage. There are some that are forbidding you from eating certain foods. Maybe a reference to the Jews who would, you can understand that they might have an issue eating pork after 1,400 years not being allowed to. But again, the point being, what are you doing? People are going to come in and they may try to get you to do these rules, but they're not of God. We have no authority. Finally, turn to Colossians chapter 2. After Philippians, right before 1 Thessalonians, Colossians 2, in verse 8, he gives the warning, the beginning, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, 
according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. Because a lot of these artificial holidays that spring up around Christianity are tied to the world. You look at all the solstices and you'll find a religious holiday that's at that same time. And it's because they were trying to just co-opt. And again, we have the idea of there are people that want to celebrate Easter. Okay, if you want to celebrate the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I, I'm all for it. That's fine with me. But the, the, the bunny that's painting the eggs? Is that in Second Opinions chapter 4? Because I haven't gotten to that book in the Bible yet. Um, so again, there are worldly things that seem to get into that, and Paul's warning them about that. But look at verses 18 and 19 of chapter 2. Again, he says, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility, the worship of angels, intruding, that's like trespassing, into those things which have not seen, has not been seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, speaking of Christ, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Well, that worship of angels was a, a part of Judaism that had carried over, and it, it's popular today in many religious circles. But again, the point is, it's condemned always in the Bible. We do not have that authority. Only God has that authority. Christianity is not about making up our own religious observances. But on the other hand, Christianity is also not about us imposing our opinions on one another. It's not about that. Sometimes scruples, it is translated. Turn to Romans 14. That's what that whole chapter is really about. There are people that have opinions. You might know someone that has an opinion. You might see them in the mirror every morning. Everybody has an opinion. But look at verse 2. There were two main issues that Paul was dealing with with this letter. We found him in verse 2 and in verse 5. Verse 2, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. This is probably referring to Gentiles who were coming to Christ, and the idea of eating meat that had been sacrificed to the false gods was troubling to them. Much of their meat that was in the public uh, sector to be purchased had been at one time sacrificed to Zeus or to one of the other false gods. So to the Greeks, where this was a significant aspect of their lives, the idea of eating meat that had been sacrificed to a false god would be against Christ, and it didn't seem right. And so they were just eating vegetables, not comfortable eating meat. It could also have referred to Jews about the pork situation that we talked about. There are a lot of meats that are out there to be bought that are forbidden. Anybody here like lobster? Boy, my Libby loves her some lobster bisque. Well, that kind of stuff is forbidden under the law of Moses. And Jews that are coming out of 1,400 years would have a hard time eating those foods. Well, the second issue is in verse 5. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. This is more than likely a reference to the Sabbath day. Again, can you imagine being a Jew 1,400 years that not only did you not do anything on the Sabbath, but if you did, they killed you, <laughs> okay? This would have been something that was ingrained. Well, now you're in Christ. Let's go do something on Sunday. They would struggle with that. So some were not doing it. And the message of Romans 14 with both of these issues, because now you have an assembly of people that are Christians that come from a Jewish background, some come from a non-Jewish background, trying to live together. And what he teaches in Romans 14 is, if you're a Gentile, and you think the idea of eating meat that may have been sacrificed to an idol is a problem, then don't eat meat. Don't violate your own conscience. That would be sin. But understand that other people 
can eat that meat if they want because an idol is nothing. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 and 10. You've got the strong brother and the weak brother. And what he means by strong and weak is those who know and those who are maybe new to the faith. And the weak brother says, it's wrong to eat meat. You can't do it. And he says, if that's how you feel, that's okay. But don't you judge your stronger brother who knows it's okay. And you, stronger brother, because Christianity is always about both sides, don't you despise your weak brother. Don't you look upon him and say, oh, dear heart, that poor little thing thinks he can't eat meat. Oh, isn't that cute? Don't be like that. He's your brother. And further, don't you hurt his conscience. Paul says the most amazing thing in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, if the eating of meat causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again. you got to say, time out, Paul. Are you serious? <laughs> Paul, are, have you been to Deuce South? Paul, have you, have, you, have you been to Dudes for that double dude? Um, never again? Paul says, never again to cause my brother to stumble. With regards to the day. Okay, well, there are some, maybe Jewish brethren, who uh, they just can't do anything on the Sabbath. That's okay. Until they learn and realize it's okay, that's fine. But they should not condemn those who know it's okay and do things on the Sabbath. And those brethren who know should not look down on those who don't know. It's all about loving one another. Christmas falls into that second one pretty neatly, doesn't it? There are brethren. I have brethren who cannot deal with Christmas. Uh, at the school of preaching that you blessed me with supporting me to go to, I had a brother who was from South America there studying. And in South America, Christmas is a serious festival tied to not only the government, but a large religious organization. And so this brother coming out of that religious organization, the idea of, of celebrating Christmas was to fall back into it. And he couldn't do it. But he didn't condemn us who did. And what did we do, do you think, as his brothers? I didn't send that brother a Christmas card. It would hurt his conscience. I did not invite that brother to come over to my house to observe Christmas together because that would have hurt my brother. Nor did he condemn me for my freedom, my Christian liberty. Christianity is about loving one another. It's not about taking our opinions and imposing them on others, okay? I'm gonna ask you all to nod and then I'll move forward if you understand what I'm saying. Excellent. So we've talked about what Chris Christmas is and what it isn't. We've talked about what Christianity is and what it isn't. Finally, let's talk about what clever is. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter nine. Beginning in verse 19. For though I am free from all men, the Apostle Paul wrote, I have made myself a servant to all. Why? That I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law. Why? That I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. Of course, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak, I became as weak. That I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. What did Paul say? He basically explained that his living his life was the fulfillment of that Romans 14. He said, when I go talk to a Jew, I talk to him as if I were a Jew. I'm not talking about his lying. I'm not talking about that he's engaging in false worship. I'm saying Paul is going to go, he's not going to go out of his way to hurt the conscience of that brother. He's not going to show up in a suit with a bunch of different threads with a big chunk of pork in his hand and say, hi, can I talk to you about Jesus? No, that would be offensive to the Jew. So to the Jew, I became as a Jew. Where did Paul go? 
he and many of the apostles, every time they came to a new city, where did they go? They went to the synagogue. Why? Were they trying to worship God according to the law of Moses? Of course not, though there are some out there that say he was. No. Paul was trying to reach people with the message of God, and these were people primed for it. Paul says, when I go to the weak, I'm as weak. If I'm trying to talk to a brother who struggles with a certain aspect of Christianity, I'm not going to go out of my way to kick dirt in his face. I'm going to be gentle and loving so that I can try and help him, that I might win the more. That's clever. To go in and just say, hello, friend, I hear you attend a denomination. Well, you understand that denominations are of the devil and all wrong, and you're going to have it. Can I talk to you about Jesus? Probably not. They're probably running away or throwing stuff at you. That's not smart. Does that mean I go and engage in false worship to reach them? No, no that would be wrong too. What uh, fellowship has the cup of Christ with the cup of demons? Clever. Turn to Luke 16 and verse 8. Jesus, after talking about the unjust servant, so the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Do you remember the story? This was a steward that found out he was going to be fired because he had been uh, skimming from the till. And he thought to himself, what am I going to do? I'm too proud to beg and I'm too old to dig. What am I going to do? Here's what I'll do. I'll talk to the people that owe my master money and I'll cut them deals. How much do you owe my master? $100. Write down 50. He's ingratiating himself to people all around at his owner's expense. Why? So that when he gets fired, he might go to that first man and say, remember me, the guy that saved you $50? How about a little talk? Okay. Notice the master complimented him on it. Now, because he was being cheating, is Jesus teaching us, we need to go out and cheat? No. Jesus is simply making the point, why did this guy do that? Because he was shrewd. He was being smart. He was using his mind to try to get himself out of a bind. And he says, sadly, the people of the world tend to be more shrewd with worldly things than we Christians are with regards to Christian things. A salesman. You go and you're looking to buy something. The salesman sidles up to you like you're his best friend, telling you jokes, thinking so, your family is the most beautiful family in the world, and all these things, on and on. I used to sell high-end homes, and if I found out one of my clients had a, a child that was in a certain sport, I might go out of my way to find out how that sport did. And then next time I speak to him, hey, I heard you guys won. Congratulations. Why? Because this is my buddy? No, because I'm trying to make a sale. Why don't you come over to dinner? I can show you the thing that I'm looking to sell to you, and uh, we can. Why am I doing that? Because I'm best friends with him? No, because I'm being shrewd and I'm trying to make a sale. That's the world. How about this, brethren? Is there someone in your life that's not in the Lord's church? And you want them to be saved? What's your plan? Do you have it written down? Have you talked to your family about how you're going to reach them? Have you made up a plan of, okay, I'm going to send them house to house, and then three weeks later, I put it on my calendar, then I'm going to call them and say, hey, did you get that thing I sent you? And then if that seems to go okay, maybe we then invite, where's your plan? You see, the world seems to be more shrewd than the children of God. So what does that have to do with Christmas? Brethren, they're talking about our Lord. They're talking about the fact that he came into the world and that was a wonderful thing. Hallelujah. We need to take advantage of this. Because anytime someone says, Merry Christmas to you, they just talked about your Lord. They started the conversation. I didn't start it. They brought him up. Oh, 
Merry Christmas to you. And isn't that the most amazing thing? Start your conversation. Maybe with some of your people you know pretty well, start talking about some of those strange things that have crept in, uh, like having the Magi be three people, having the Magi there with the shepherd. And you understand that they weren't together. You understand that's not a right picture. And maybe that's a way to start because I know with myself coming to Christ, when you start kicking the legs out of false beliefs, I start looking for new beliefs. And there we are. Let's be wise and clever about this. Let's use the season to help glorify our Lord. Instead of, as I've seen all too many brethren, well, you know, that wasn't the day he was born. Okay. Thank you. How is that helpful? Be clever. Reach out. We have such opportunities. Brethren, Christmas is a secular holiday, so enjoy it. Or don't. If you don't want to have a tree, if, if you don't want to have presents, if you don't want to put lights up, if you don't want to do all of us, then don't. You don't have to. There's nothing ordained of God that says that you must. But understand that some other people may enjoy that. So don't judge them. And if you know a brother that uh, doesn't engage in Christmas and doesn't like to celebrate it, maybe you even know that he's got some issues of conscience with, this, with it, then be, be conscious of that yourself when you interact. And don't go out of your way to, to step on his toes. But brethren, whatever you do with regards to this secular holiday, do all in the name of our Lord and to glorify him. If the world, for at least the day, just giving lip service, then let us be praised. Let us be so, make that pleased, let us be so pleased with that. And take that opportunity to tell them why you think the day of his birth was a great day and that you should be merry? Let me tell you about the day of his death. Because that's the day. That's the day we focus on. His coming into the world was important. He couldn't be born, or he couldn't die unless he was born. But let's get them talking about the day he died for them and the love he has for them. Let's be does it say, wise as serpents, harmless as doves? If you're not a Christian this morning, God calls you to himself through his son. He has demonstrated his love. He loves you so much that he sent his son into this world to shed his blood on the cruel cross of Calvary that you might be saved, free from your sin, and be able to be with him forever. If you've never done that, taken God up on his offer of grace, why not this morning? Christians, Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is full contact. We are in this world, but brethren, we are not of this world. So while we are here, let us take advantage of every minute and every opportunity, like Christmas, like Easter, like whatever it could be, to serve our God, to glorify him, and fulfill his joy, that everyone be saved by coming to the knowledge of the truth. If you haven't been walking that walk, if you haven't been serving your Lord, turn back. And if there's anything we can do to help, we'd ask that you come as together we stand and sing.